Oh uh-huh. 
My name is Marissa, and I've been attending community for about seven years. We walked into Community Christian Plainfield, and I was just in awe. First of all, everyone was so kind. Pastor John Sosniewski led through communion, and he was like, this is about a relationship, not a religion. I sat back and I was like, wow. All right, I want to get to know who this God is. And just from there, we just kept attending community. And then I ended up joining Stuco, and that just helped immensely, like having strong, godly, wise followers just pour into me. I joined the worship team because I wanted friends. I learned what worship was, why we worship, who we worship. There were so many moments I was like, God is real. I am a completely different person now than I was, you know, seven years ago when I was 16. I remember this moment so vividly when I got called into ministry. We were at Blast, we were singing, Build My Life. And I was just singing background vocals. And I remember the specific moment where I got really choked up and emotional, like looking at everybody in the congregation, students that were younger than me, older than me, leaders, all just coming before in unity to declare holy, like there is no one like you, there is none beside you. And I just felt like the Lord was like, like this is what I made you to do. Like I created you to lead my people in worship. And I prayed about it, we prayed about it, and I just felt like, okay, like I'm supposed to go into ministry. And I don't know what that looks like, but like God blesses obedience. And I was like, like I'm committed to following you. And now it's mind blowing to look back, you know, seven years and to be working for the church where I found my way back to God. Community is just so genuine when they mean that their mission is helping people find their way back to God. Like, it is their heart cry. It's the way that they, they live. And now to be able to just like be one of the people that helped to like push that mission forward is just so humbling. Hello and welcome to Community Online. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Here at Community, we are committed to helping people find their way back to God. This mission is the heartbeat behind everything we do. We believe the life you are longing for can be found in a growing connection with God, the church, and the world God has given us to love and serve. It's what we've been calling the You Plus Life. And if you're unsure how to get started, drop us a comment and we'll be sure to connect with you because we wanna help you experience it. If you're new here, I wanna say a special welcome. By joining us today, you've already taken your first step and we would love to help you take your next steps. To do that, scan the QR code to check in and create an account so we can learn your name and reach out. Or feel free to say hello in the chat or request prayer. We would love to connect with you. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the state of mind Jesus encourages us to have when we're giving. He doesn't want us to give reluctantly. He doesn't want us to do it because a pastor said we need to or because we feel we have to. He wants us to give because not only does it bless others, but because it blesses us. When you sow generously, you reap generously. When you give back to God here at Community, instead of focusing on what you're giving up, focus on what you're helping to bring to life. So I invite you to join me right now in giving back to God. You can give online by setting up your recurring a gift or going to givenow.cc or by texting the word GIVE to 331-226-1686. And as you give today, we're in for a special treat. As we conclude our series, Her Story, Women and the Bible, we're going to join a powerful conversation between three people who are passionate about empowering women to flourish in their gifts God has given them. Here's our lead pastor apprentice, Ted Canaris, to tell you a little bit more. Anytime women are put into leadership or preach or are platformed, it's an opportunity to shape the imagination yes. of the church. I genuinely hope that every girl, every young woman, every woman sees community as a place where I can fully use my gifts for the mission of Jesus. That was the intention at the beginning of creation. This, this mutuality, this equality, this men and women side by side carrying out the rule of God in the world. I am really excited about the conversation that we're all about to hear. I want you to know that I am deeply committed to us being a church where every person, women and men alike, can flourish to the fullness of the gifting that God has given them. And so with that in mind, let me introduce you to the three people that you're going to hear from in this conversation. Two of them you likely already know, our lead pastor, Dave Ferguson, and the leader of our teaching team, Tammy Melchin. And Dave and Tammy are going to be joined by Tara Beth Leach. 
Tara Beth is the pastor of Good Shepherd Church in Naperville and a highly sought after conference speaker and retreat speaker. She has published three books, including Emboldened, A Vision for Empowering Women in Ministry. And she's been married to her husband, Jeff, for nearly 20 years, and together they have two amazing sons. She's also a great friend of mine here in our community. And so lean in and let's enjoy this conversation. Tammy and Tara Beth, I want to say thanks uh, so much for for joining us. Um, We are wrapping up our series, Her Story, and we've been discovering how women uh, throughout the Bible, but particularly New Testament, both led and taught. Mm -hmm. And I know both of you have spent, I think, your whole adult life either leading or teaching in churches. So maybe to get us started, I'm just curious, what led you and kind of gave you a desire for that kind of a vocation? Yeah. Tara Beth? Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be digging into this topic with you. You know, for me, I was called into ministry at 16 years old. And when I was called into ministry, I had no imagination for what that looked like. Mm -hmm. Jesus had just so captivated my life, changed my life, wrecked my life in every incredible way possible that I couldn't imagine doing anything other than telling others about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, and so for me, it wasn't even necessary. It wasn't a career path. It wasn't, oh, I know what I want to be when I grow up. It wasn't, oh, I know what I'm going to study in college. It was, Jesus has called me to be a fisher of men. Jesus has called me to preach the gospel, to tell the world that Jesus is alive. And it was this overwhelming sense that I was going to explode if I didn't do that. Love that so early on in your journey too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. So Tammy, let's let's hear, uh, hear I your, think, sp- your yeah, story. Yeah, I think for me, I honestly cannot remember a time in my life when I just did not like have this all encompassing love for Jesus. I, I just feel like even as like three, you're almost born in three, four, five year old. Yeah. Oh. I mean, and you know, we've talked about how I live in my head a lot of times. I tell my friends and, and I feel like my co- most conscious memories are of just being in love with Jesus. And then as I grew up, um, leadership was called out of me in, mm-hmm. in lots of different arenas, like in school, in youth group, in sports. Uh, playing sports. Like I was usually the captain on the team, mm-hmm. but I, I didn't grow up seeing any models of women in ministry. Yeah. So it never would have crossed my mind to pursue that vocationally. But when I was 19 years old, I met a woman that, um, her name's Laura Hobbs, and she was she was doing campus ministry full-time. Mm. And it blew my mind <laughs> to realize that it, it had never crossed my mind, but once I saw it, that I could combine this passion and this love I have for Jesus with these leadership gifts, I just never to that point before seen that as something that could be done in the church. Mm-hmm. But the minute that it that it was modeled for me, mm-hmm. like I knew mm-hmm. that's what I was going to do with my life. And she went on and apprenticed you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's kind of the beginning of the story. Yeah. And I know both of you well enough to know there's been some challenges along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mind sharing some of those unique challenges, particularly as it pertains to being a woman in yeah. uh in leadership. Some of the challenges, some of those, I bet we both have some stories. (laughs) Probably the story that comes to mind for me is, is when I was, I was actually, you know, already on the staff here at Community, but I was moving into the city to plant a new location of Community. I was going to be the the campus pastor, we call them Community Pastors now, of a new location. And, you know, it was a challenge. I hadn't really seen a woman do that before either. Um, but one of the things, you know, you hear all the time is, well, if you're going to lead a church plant, you got to be able to raise the money. Well, why I was in that season, um, I actually found out that my home church, the church that I'd grown up in since I was three weeks old, um, my parents attended for 40 years. Uh, sadly, the church was closing. And, uh, you know, and that was just sad. I mean, it had dwindled down to just a handful of people and they couldn't afford to keep the building open anymore. Well, what I found out was they sold the building and they had like eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars that they needed to figure out how to distribute. Wow. And this is right at the same time that I am like fundraising for this new ch- church plant. And I thought, man, what is like it, it's sad that this church is dying, but what a beautiful story it could be that out of the death of this church, a new church is born right. like through one of its own. 
Yeah, somebody who grew up there. Yeah, yeah. And so I contacted them, and the response I got was, um, they said, well, first of all, don't call yourself a pastor, was the first thing that was said to me. And I cast the vision for it, but like, then I, I feel like I was ghosted like for weeks and until eventually when, when someone finally got back to me, they told me that they decided to, to give the money to things they already knew. That was probably the most painful like experience of, um, for me. I mean, I have more stories. I'm sure you have stories. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I think every woman in ministry, like, I've gone through the things where, you know, I get the letters in the mail, anonymous letters. You're not a real pastor. Um, you're, you know, you shouldn't be doing this or that sometimes some of the more micro things that are said to us. Or the people getting up and leaving. Or getting people getting up and leaving. That certainly has happened. Uh, but I would say probably the most difficult challenge for me was the church that I pastored in Southern California. Mm oftentimes the church leadership and board is is very ready for a woman, mm-hmm. but the congregation may not be. Mm-hmm. And this particular church in Pasadena, that was the case. The leadership was ready. Uh, the congregation, however, was not. And so several hundred people left the church as a result. And so I never went into ministry to make it about gender, mm-hmm. but the congregation I was pastoring did. And so that was really, really painful. Uh, and so one of the things I'm now passionate about is helping churches um, know whether or not they're ready to call a yeah. pastor, because yeah. uh, readiness is so important. And thanks be to God, I now pastor a church that turns out was it was ready, ready for it. Yeah. yeah. I had a female leader uh, tell me that I never enter a room that I don't feel judgment. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I mean, I guess being a guy, I mean, I was like, really? Never. And she's like, never. Mm. And so I think the the kind of situations that you face i mean they're not unfortunately they're not unique no um, almost i think probably almost every woman leader in in the church settings has has those kind of stories which is exactly why we're why we're addressing yeah. this, this topic and i look at community christian and i see the ways that you do platform women that you do have women in leadership mm-hmm. and i just have to tell you from afar That is making an incredible impact and an incredible ripple effect in Naperville, DuPage, Kendall, Kane, and beyond Chicagoland. Uh, And so I I just wonder, as I think about Community Christian, like, why? Why do you do this? And how do you do this? I I think for us at Community, yeah. I mean, some people think it's like kind of a new position, something we came to recently. But this this is something that's been over 30 years. Currently, like right now, we we have elders. We call them the Leadership Commission. They oversee our doctrine, discipline, and direction. We call the three Ds. Mm -hmm. But when we first planted, we had something called the Leadership Advisory Team Mm -hmm. that we just kind of put in place to help set things in in direction before we had elders. And our Leadership Advisory Team, they kind of, took on this particular issue. Okay, which way are we, what do we think about this? And we, it was over a year of us kind of studying this. But at the end of that year, we came to the conclusion like, no, we feel like both through the Old Testament and the New Testament, the whole of Scripture, that women ought to be able to lead at whatever level according to their to their gift in this. In some ways, I think you could almost go all the way back to Genesis chapter one, because if you go back to Genesis chapter one, I mean, that's God's dream, right. God's dream for the world right there at sure. the very beginning. Sure. And I think that's kind of, we, we take a look at that. And I think that establishes right there, okay, this idea of kind of mutuality and equality. Mm-hmm. And Tammy, you, you taught our staff with a whole Bible study on this. Why, why don't you pick that yeah. up? Based on Genesis 1. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about Genesis 1, and it really is the foundation yeah. of our theology uh, for this. And, and, and right in the first chapter, when we talk about God creating human beings, um, if you read Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then we're told that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And when I think about that, you know, of course, the scripture is telling us that that all of us are made in the image of God. And so we can't say that God is male. We can't say that God is female. 
But whatever it means to be made in the image of God, we both as male and as female uh, represent that. But one of the things I think is so key in this passage is that in the beginning, men and women are giving the, given the same mandate, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, the same exact mandate to rule right. over the rest of creation. So important. And, and there is no hierarchy in that. It's not like, okay, you rule and you help. <laughs> you know, it, it's the same mandate that we're given. And if you remember right after that, at the end of that first chapter, when God looks at his finished creation, he says, not only does he say it's good, what does he say? That it's yeah. very good. good. Right. I mean, that was the intention at the beginning of creation, mm-hmm. this this mutuality, mm-hmm. this equality, this mm-hmm. men and women side by side carrying out the rule yeah. of God in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's a beautiful picture of shalom, yeah. um, which is where we want to tilt our lives to, that yeah. vision of shared mutuality, that the world was functioning as it should, yeah. that there was this perfect harmony that humans um, were in harmony. So Adam and Eve were in harmony with one another. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve were also in harmony with God. Mm -hmm. They were also in harmony with With creation. Creation Creation was in harmony, which is no wonder then we see this shared picture of stewarding God's creation, Mm -hmm. this incredible gift that they were given together. Yeah, and and that was and continues to be God's dream Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the world. Mm -hmm. Now, it makes me think, though, if you turn around, if you turn the page to the the other creation narrative in Genesis two, which is another retelling of creation, there is a verse here yes. that I think can mess people up and 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 makes people distort what that dream was. And it's it's uh, verse eighteen in chapter two, where it says the you know so God has created the man and then said the Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Mm -hmm. And what's the word that throws us off? Helper. Helper. That's right. And and I think it throws us off because we don't really understand what that word means. That's right. I wonder if you you want to take that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think oftentimes when we hear the word helper, we think that it's some sort of subordinate position, almost less than. We often project our understanding of very worldly hierarchies Mm -hmm. onto that word Mm -hmm. that if someone is a helper, then there must be a leader, right, Mm -hmm. naturally. But interestingly, this word, this Hebrew word is azer. And one of the things that we discover is it's used 100 times in the Old Testament. And and so a helpful thing to do whenever we get to a tricky passage, we have to understand or ask ourselves, so is this prescriptive or is it descriptive? But also we have to say, how do we view this in light of the entire story of God? So if this word is used a hundred other times and 20 to one of the times, it's the exact same word. Then we've got to say, when it's used in other places, what does, what it, does mean? it mean? Right. Yeah. Now here's where it gets interesting. When it's used in other places in scripture, it is attached to God. Mm-hmm. God is our helper, mm. Azer. God is not our helper because we are trying to usurp mm. God's role, but it means a coming alongside of mm. and empowering mm. and equipping and emboldening. And so this word Azer with Adam um, and Eve, well, attached to Eve, it's not that she is subordinate to him and that Adam is a leader, but instead that she is the perfect complement to him, Mm -hmm. that they together share this incredible power that they have been given to steward God's creation, Mm -hmm. and that she comes alongside him in the same way that he also comes alongside alongside of her. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful picture. So what we really have in Genesis 1 and 2 is you do have this picture of shalom, or we we always talk about it in communities, God's dream. God's dream for the world, his original dream, his original intention. But then you get to Genesis 3, and we have the fall. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there's another verse, I think, that also kind of throws people off, because in 3.16, it talks about the man ruling over mm-hmm. oh, yeah. the woman. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think what messes us up sometimes is we think, oh, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. No, 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 no. I think, again, we have to, again, look at the whole there, one, two, and three, because it's in three when the fall happens, and it's after the fall. Yep. And so this is actually a consequence. Yeah. Am I right about this? A consequence yeah, of a consequence. sin and not something like God intended for it to be in the very beginning of mutuality and equality. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where hierarchy and this idea of a person or a gender being over another right. came into play. And I think it broke God's heart. 
Because yeah. sure. it was not his dream. Well, and that's the thing in Genesis 3, after so after the curses roll out, and this is this by the way goes back to what I was getting at was prescriptive versus descriptive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? God isn't prescribing this because after the curses roll out, God doesn't say, At last, we've arrived. Yeah. Now it's I'm very, so very, glad. very good. <laughs> I, yeah, now it's very, very good. We've arrived. We don't need to do anything else. Yeah. The world is as it should be. No, like the world was as it shouldn't be mm-hmm. and god isn't prescribing how things should be we see that we see that in mm-hmm. genesis 1 and 2 the picture god is describing not prescribing but describing how things will be and as you said that grieves the heart yeah. of god yeah but he also starts his plan of redemption right, right away absolutely and, and restoring his dream absolutely. is where the story goes through the whole rest of the bible yes. including restoring his dream yep. for men and women to live in this mutuality exactly. and that's where when we look at the whole of scripture of course we see this idea of of patriarchy in there we see mm-hmm. this i this picture of of sometimes even positions being abused mm-hmm. But that's not prescriptive. It's descriptive it is a of the way things are. It's a reality of yeah. the way things are. But as you said, God, the, the, the story of God is redemptive. Mm-hmm. It's not static. In other words, it is moving somewhere that God is working to restore that picture of shalom in this world that mm-hmm. was disrupted yeah. when we read about in Genesis chapter 3. And we see that fully unleashed and inaugurated in the person of Jesus. Absolutely. I think it's hard for us in this day and age to to really recognize how cul- countercultural Jesus was Absolutely. in the way that he mm-hmm. related to women. I and mean, when you think about, like, from the woman at the well, mm-hmm. who it, you know, it says right there in Scripture, normally that would not happen, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, for him to engage her in a conversation, to I think about Mary being, you know, permitted to sit at his feet like a disciple. And, I mean, over and over again, you just see Jesus living out the mutuality. Yeah. That, that was God's dream. That is God's dream. That he is living that out in the way that he treats women. That's for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. And I think we see the climax or the pinnacle of that mm-hmm. moment in one of the most important encounters that we see in, in all of scripture, in my view. In, and that's on the day of Easter, the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Jesus, mm-hmm. Jesus comes out of the tomb. Jesus is alive. Mary goes to the tomb weeping. Um, she's upset that Jesus is dead. She's upset that now his body is gone. Someone has taken his body. And Jesus comes and he finds her and he sees her there weeping and she's distraught. And um, at first she thinks it's a gardener. But as soon as he says her name, mm-hmm. yeah. she turns to him and what does she call him? Teacher. 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 Right. And Jesus could have come out. And seen Mary there and said, it's great that you're here. Go get Peter. Go get Peter. Because <laughs> no one's going to believe you when you, because you're a woman. Yeah. Like, no yeah. one's going to believe you. Yeah. Uh, the testimony of a woman. And, and by the way, like, you shouldn't be the one to preach this. We need some men to do it. But actually, we see this remarkable reversal mm-hmm. of the curses in the garden. Um, we see this, this reversal because it, 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 in the, in the original garden, um, when God calls out to Adam and Eve, they hide um, and they feel shame. And in this new garden that we see as Jesus comes out of the tomb and he calls for Mary, um, she doesn't hide, yeah. but instead she turns towards him. And he then calls her, he asks her, he says, Mary, I want you to go and preach and tell this good news that I'm not dead, that I am alive. Yeah. And we see the very first Easter sermon. And I think it's why Paul continually talks about new creation. Right. New creation, because that's yeah. what's happened. Absolutely. It's, it's the new creation has come into the world. That's and right. so we no longer have to live by the curse. Yeah. We can now live by the dream yeah. in the new creation. And so, I mean, Jesus' influence then, you see in the kind of culture that we have in the early church, which was counterculture. Absolutely. Which brings yeah. us again kind of full story. What we've been doing in this series, we've been looking at people who are leaders and teachers in the early church, like Priscilla, like Phoebe, like Junia. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that is because of how Jesus treated women 
the early church was different in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jesus levels the table for us where there's no hierarchy. And the Apostle Paul highlights this in Galatians 3.28, when he says, Therefore there is neither Greek nor Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male nor female, but mm-hmm. all are one in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. In other words, Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, mm-hmm. in, my, in the economy of my kingdom, there's no hierarchy. We're back to mutuality. Back to mutuality. But it also gets kind of confusing, though, later on. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we clearly yes. have that, but it gets kind of, because because Paul, yeah. who actually commends right. those women and their leadership and their influence and their teaching, kind of says some things later on that yeah. kind of throws, <laughs> throws some of us for a little bit of a loop. And I think the verse that we hear most, and I think we should go there for a little bit, because... Yeah. People who are reading the Bible. We know where you're going. Okay, okay. where am I going, Tammy? (laughs) First Timothy 2. I think so. The NIV version says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Okay, explain that one to me. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting. It's It's where you have to, I mean, it does rock you a little bit. But the thing that is tricky about this scripture is, if you're going to build your whole theology about women and what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do in the church based on this one verse, you really have to explain away <laughs> the great arc and, yeah. and much more of Scripture. Yeah. Right, and I think it goes back to, I, I keep using these phrases because for me it's been the key to unlocking so many of these confusing passages, again, prescriptive and descriptive. Mm-hmm. It, we can often figure out what if something is prescriptive, timeless for all, all ages, all eternity, yeah. if it is congruent with the whole, the of, the whole story of scripture. Of God. Yes. And we've seen incongruency here, right? So yes. I guess this is occurred like maybe some maybe something else was going on. Yeah. Maybe this is a descriptive reality that we need to get underneath and understand a little bit more. Ephesus had a unique culture in that because their their main temple was to the goddess Artemis, uh, women actually had the more prominent role right. in the pagan yes. religious yeah. you know, culture there. And so what I find interesting too is in this in this passage when when Paul says, I do I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. That word authority mm-hmm. in the Greek um, what that word means is, you know, like he could have used any yeah. number of words for, I do not permit him to lead or to, you know, be in charge or anything like that. The word that he uses there is a word that means dominate, mm-hmm. domineer over. Yep. And again, based on what we know of the religious culture there, I think women were in the pagan religions dominating. Yeah. And so I think there's a, a likely a good chance that as some of those women became followers of Jesus, they still operated the same way in the church and they wanted to dominate over the men. Yeah. And, and Paul is saying, no, 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 no. In, in the, in the church of Jesus, in the way of God, there's no dominating. There's mutuality. One of the power struggles that we see as the backdrop within the story of God is this power struggle between men and women, women seeking to dominate over, men seeking to to rule over, mm-hmm. which neither, neither are the intentions for what God wants for us. Mm-hmm. And so, again, like this was a very particular mm-hmm. biblical problem that was happening in that time. Mm-hmm. Again, I love your, you know, it's it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive yeah. of what was happening in that one case. And if we're to take a principle out of it, I think the principle out of it is is there shouldn't be domineering in the church. Yeah. That's the principle we exactly. should take from it. Exactly. Well, yeah. and the other thing that I'm taking from this conversation is as we develop a theology I mean, on anything, it mm-hmm. needs to be based on the whole of Scripture. Absolutely. Right. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing here, which... You know, again, I'm grateful for both of you guys for helping with that. With this framework in mind that we're talking about for women in ministry, what is your hope for community Christian in the future? I genuinely hope that every girl, every young woman, every woman sees community as a place where I can fully use my gifts for the mission of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, from research that, uh, I mean, girls somewhere most of between 8 to 14 start to lose confidence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would love it, love it, love it if community was a place where that didn't happen, mm-hmm. but instead it instilled confidence where they're going like, man, this is a place where I can be everything that God meant me yeah. to be. Anytime women are put into leadership or preach or are platformed, 
it's an opportunity to shape the imagination yes. of the church. I mean, even just, I think about yesterday um, after worship, there was a 16-year-old girl that had been invited by one of her friends. She's been coming to worship frequently. We have all of our teenagers sit together. Mm-hmm. It was maybe her third time at Good Shepherd Church. And she came up to me after worship with tears in her eyes, yeah. first just talking about how much she loves this place, how meaningful, even after her third time to worship. And then she said, and I want to do what you do. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. I want to do what you do. Yeah. Uh, it, having a woman, yeah. um, having women, it shapes the imagination. Yeah, it's, it's hard to be it if you don't see it. Yeah. yeah. And even if they don't become like vocational right. pastors, yeah. they're seeing modeled before them mutuality right. Right. in a way that Absolutely. that is restoring God's Absolutely. dream for the world. I really enjoyed that conversation. I'm so grateful for all the women at Community who are using their gifts to further the mission of Jesus. We want community to be a place where every person can thrive in the gifts God has given them so that together we can bring more of His kingdom to earth. Just for a second, think about the girls and young women who are growing up in our church. Let's commit together as a church community to do everything we can to encourage these girls and young women to be everything God has created them to be. Let's encourage them, affirm their gifts, and pray for them. Please allow me to pray these words over you right now. Father, we thank you for making every one of us in your image and for giving us gifts to further your mission. As a community, we want to say a special thanks for the women in our community. Thank you for who you created them to be. Our prayer is that our church will be a place where every woman can flourish for your kingdom and your glory. We thank you for the girls and young women you have entrusted to us. Whether we are their parents or part of their church family, may we be people who encourage them as they grow up to become all you've created them to be. We pray for their flourishing too. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to receive communion together, let me remind you of these words from the Apostle John. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. God lavished His love on us by laying down His life for us so that we could find our way back to God and live as His beloved children. Revel in that for a few moments as we sing and prepare to receive communion together.
out Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus
beloved children of God, let's receive the bread his body broken for us. And the cup his blood shed for us. Would you pray with me? Creator God, I pray for every single one of us that we would all come to recognize that each one of us is a unique and wonderful display of your image, that we would recognize that within ourselves, but also everyone we encounter. And may we all discover who you created us to be and grow into the fullness of that. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I'm so glad you were able to join us today, and I hope you will join us again next week as we begin a brand new series called Spiritual Warfare, Renewing Our Minds. I believe this will be a powerful series through which God wants to lead us to freedom, so don't miss it. As always, be sure to head to communitychristian.info to find out about everything that is happening this week at Community, and we'll see you right back here next week at Community Online.